Actually, that was the time that CBS was rating all of the NBC talent. Hal Perry, Hal's agent, signed him to CBS. Kraft decided they did not want to change networks, and so they had to recast Gilly. Hal and I had a voice similarity. It finally came down to the fact that I felt, and Frank Pittman, who was the producer, felt that I could do it without having to do an imitation. It worked out very nicely. It would have been dangerous for someone to imitate Hal Perry. I think you yeah. couldn't you really couldn't well, carry that off. It was a difficult decision because the producers weren't quite sure whether they wanted to try to keep the voice somewhat the same or whether they wanted a completely mm -hmm. different voice.、Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure whether I wanted to do it because if I had failed with it, I'd have been out of my ear. So we finally did a reading with the writers. The character was so well written. I found that I could play it. As I say our voice similarity. My voice is a little bit deeper than Hal's, but the quality was there. Voice quality was there. I didn't have to make any conscious effort to do any imitation or anything like that. One rather strange thing that a lot of people don't understand: the Gillis the laugh. He <laughs> was really Hal's. He used it as Gildersleeve. When I came into the picture, I decided I didn't want to use it because he used to use that to do a character on called Professor Rollo on a show we did in Chicago called Thank You Stuzia with Bernadine <laughs> Flynn.、Mm -hmm. And I never did the laugh. I mean, I laughed, but not that laugh. And I used to do what they called the Gildersleeve social chuckle. <laughs> but I didn't do the laugh,、uh -huh. and still to this day. If I'm introduced to somebody and they say, "Oh, you were Gildersleeve," let me hear you laugh because、mm -hmm. it was so well ingrained in the character. Did you、um, find it difficult to follow Hal Perry? No, I didn't, because as I say, the writing was so beautifully done. John Elliott and Andy White and Paul West, who were writing the show, wrote it so wonderfully that I just played the character. Hal. And I had been friends, and still continue to be friends. I've seen him through the years a lot, and we get along very well. And I think Hal may have been a little resentful at the time, but I, I don't think he, for the on the long range, he was. Willard Waterman had been portraying Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve since the fall of 1950, when Harold Perry left the program. In the spring of 1954, The Great Gildersleeve was airing Wednesdays at 8:30 p.m. Eastern Time over NBC. Kraft had sponsored the program since the debut in 1941. The show's 5.8 rating was good enough for 14th overall, and NBC's fourth highest program. It easily beat out CBS's 21st Precinct, airing opposite at the same time. Did the general public realize that there was a change of lead actors in The Great Gildersleeve back in? That time. I think many of them did not know. The billing was different, but in those days, people didn't pay all that much attention to billing.、Mm -hmm. The voice had enough similarity that a lot of people, for a long time anyway, didn't know there was a change. I guess some people still don't know. The name、uh, Gildersleeve is bigger than the name Perry or Waterman. Neither one of us have that personal identification.、Mm -hmm. Oh, you、I、have the personal identification with the role of the great Gildersleeve. Well, a lot of people do.、Yes. A lot of people still say, "Oh, that was Hal Perry."、Yeah. And as I say, we both did it for nine years. So,、yeah. it's amazing that that show ran that long. I can't imagine that Hal Perry would have thought in,、uh, you know, 1949, 1950, when he you took it over in 50, didn't 50, you? At the、yeah. beginning of that, did you think that it was going to last for? You know I, that many more years. I had no idea at the time how long it would last. Hal maybe got a little short shrift from his agent, because they thought they could deliver the show to CBS. 
mm-hmm. and they signed him to the contract. So now he was under contract at CBS. They had to produce a show for him. So they started a show called Honest Harold. Mm-hmm. And I think it was unfortunate what they tried to do was pattern the show after the Gildersleeve show. And of course, Gildersleeve was still on, mm-hmm. on NBC. So it didn't work. And it was too bad because Hal was a very versatile actor. He could do many, many, many voices, many, many things. And it would have been far better for him, I believe, had he developed another character. Mm-hmm. A new show around it, and then that would have been as the pattern was, gone on to television, it would have been another new good show, mm-hmm. radio, mm-hmm. television show. But with the sort of a copy of Gildersleeve, it just didn't work. On April 14th, Gildersleeve hosted a dinner party for Bronco's boss. The Kraft Foods Company presents Willard Waterman as the Great Gildersleeve. The Great Gildersleeve is brought to you, transcribed by the Kraft Foods Company. And Kraft, you know, makes the famous pasteurized processed cheese food, Velveeta. Velveeta has a wonderful cheddar cheese flavor that's rich yet delightfully mild. It's delicious, and it's the finest quality cheese food you can buy because it's made by Kraft, the name that for years has meant only the finest in cheese and cheese food. Get a package or loaf of Velveeta tomorrow and enjoy the cheese food of top quality. Velveeta, made only by Kraft. Well, let's see what's doing in the great Gildersleeve city of Summerfield. Along about this time every morning, the bulky figure of the water commissioner emerges from City Hall and ambles along the tree-lined walk that takes him to Peavy's pharmacy. Right, George. Peavy has a lot of rabbits in his window. Well, Easter's next Sunday. Rabbits look better in the winter than hot water bottles. (laughs) Hello, Peavy. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. (laughs) What can I do for you this morning? Uh, Peavy, that's quite a display of chocolate rabbits you have in the window. Mm, I think so. Why don't you get live ones? Well, if I had live ones, I'd have to feed them. These feed me. Have a bite. What's that? And you're pretty good chocolate. Go ahead, bite off his other ear. Well, I love chocolate. I <laughs> think I will break off a chunk. Sorry, rabbit. Mmm, <laughs> almonds. Mm, well, yeah, it's the best part of the rabbit. <laughs> See, I, I think I'll take home a bag of these. Very well. I've sold a lot of candy this way. Oh? But I'm getting pretty sick of eating rabbits. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, just charge it, Peavy. Well, well. Uh, how about some candy for your girlfriend? Well, I have been seeing a lot of Miss Olsen recently, but uh, I thought I'd send her an Easter lily. Well, she can't eat that. Oh. <laughs> oh for... I strongly recommend the king-size chocolate rabbit. You might say, take a bunny to your honey. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I'm going to take candy. I'll take something elegant like chocolate covered cherries. Very well. Say, isn't that your niece's husband out front? Yeah, that's Bronco looking over your rabbit display. <laughs> I'm not going to need another one if he comes in here. Hello, Mr. Peavy. Well, hello, Bronco. Bronco, how are you, my boy? Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah, I'll take a package of gum here, Mr. Peavy. Very well. How are things going at the plant? Oh, just great. Uh, Peavy, I guess you heard Bronco's boss is sending him to Paris as branch manager. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my boss is a great guy. Yeah, I'd like to do something real nice for him. Care to take him a chocolate rabbit? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Mr. Peavy, you're kidding. (laughs) Uh, Bronco, have you ever entertained your boss? Oh, I couldn't entertain Mr. Hammond. He's a big shot. He lives out at the country club. (laughs) What could I do to entertain him? Well, you might invite him out to the house to meet the little family. Those fellows enjoy a little home cooking, don't they, Peavy? Mm, I do. I'd put Mrs. Peavy up against the country club any time. 
Well, no, I don't know. I don't think I should invite him over. He might think it's a little dull. No, Bronco, you are making a mistake. You could have an interesting little dinner party. You can invite me. Well, it... and I can invite Miss Olson. Her accent would give the party kind of a classy flavor. And I could bring Mrs. Peavy. <laughs> What's that? She used to play the musical song. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Peavy, I'm serious. Well, Mrs. Peavy used to be serious about the musical song. She nearly got a tryout with Major Bowles. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, I don't think Marge could handle such a big dinner party. <laughs> well, I was only judging, Bronco. Mrs. Peavy's out of town anyway. Well, Marge, you could get Bertie to help her. Yeah, I'd be glad to come. Yeah, I've entertained the mayor. Well, I would like to know the boss socially. You just invite him and leave everything to me. Well, this is very nice of you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, should Marjorie call Miss Olson? No, yeah, I'll take care of that. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Hammond will enjoy an evening like that, won't he, Peavy? Well, if Miss Olson's there, he'll enjoy the evening all right. Well, that's why I'm inviting her. I'm doing a favor for Bronco. And it might turn out to be a favor to Mr. Hammond. <laughs> That you, Miss Gillespie? Yes, Bertie, I'm home. I thought that was you. Bertie, can you leave the kitchen a minute? Yes, sir. I don't think that Stu's going to miss me. Stu? Hey, Bertie. How'd you like to cook for Mr. Dudley Hammond? Uh oh, you mean I'm fired? We don't have to have stew tonight. <laughs> no, you're not fired. We can never get along without you. <laughs> I know that, but somebody might think they can. <laughs> no, indeed. What I have in mind is you might like to help Marjorie with her dinner party. Oh, I'd like that. But Miss Marjorie was over here and she didn't say anything about a dinner party. Well, it was my idea. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, I suggested it to Bronco. Sort of promote him with his boss. Yes, sir. With Bertie in the kitchen, Mr. Bronco's practically promoted. <laughs> That's the spirit. Bertie's modest. That's one thing I can say for me. I'm modest. Yeah. But when Mr. Dudley Hammond tastes Bertie's cooking, his eyes is going to light up like a pinball machine. Well, I know we can count on you. Anki? Oh, hello, Marjorie. Anki, Bronco just phoned and he has the most marvelous idea. We're having a dinner party for Mr. Hammond. Oh, wait a minute. That's my idea. Oh? Well, anyway, it's a wonderful idea. Hi, everybody. Hello, Leroy. What's a wonderful idea? Oh, one of mine. Miss Gilsey wants me to do the cooking. Oh, would you, Bertie? What's cooking? Just imagine, Unky. He accepted our invitation. You bet. Who accepted what invitation? Uh, Leroy, this doesn't concern you. If it has anything to do with eating, it concerns me. Oh. <laughs> you can go to a movie and have dinner at Mr. Peavy's drugstore. Well, I'll go to a movie, but I won't have dinner at Mr. Peavy's. I'm so full of chocolate rabbits now, I could hop. <laughs> well, I'll treat you to dinner out someplace. Well, why are you paying to get rid of me? I'm giving a dinner party for Bronco's boss at Marjorie's house, and Bertie's going to cook it. Get him. He says he's giving it. <laughs> well, Unky did give us the idea, and it's a very good one. Yeah, thank you, my dear. Well, I have to run home. I want to get the house ready for tomorrow night. I'll be over to help you, Miss Marjorie. Uh, thank you, Bertie. Goodbye, Unky Leroy. Goodbye, my dear. So long. How many's going to be at the party, Miss Gilsey? You're just Bronco's boss, and I've invited Miss Olson. For him? For me, young man. And just to liven up the evening. Oh, brother, you live dangerously. He sure does. What do you mean? Mr. Hammond's a handsome bachelor. I'll say I've seen him. Oh? I went out to the plant with Bronco. Mr. Hammond was dictating to three secretaries. Three secretaries? And none of them knew what he was saying. <laughs> they just sat looking at him. He was so handsome, he had him practically swooning. <laughs> Leroy, you're exaggerating. Every time he'd say, dear sir, they'd go, ah. <laughs> Bronco tells me when women come around, Mr. Hammond, he runs. Which way? <laughs> Away from them. That's why he's still a successful bachelor. Oh, Mr. Gilsley don't have much to worry about. Yeah, no, of course not. I could see that when Miss Olson was over here last week. Miss Gillsleeve had a mumbling to herself. <laughs> she wasn't mumbling to herself. She was speaking French. Now, uh, Leroy. Uh, one of those other languages. That's it. Mr. Gillsleeve got her talking to herself in five different languages. 
Oh, well, Bertie. Yes, sir. He's got a tongue to himself in French, Swedish, Italian, Spanish, and turtle dove English. You mean pigeon English? No, when she talks to Mr. Gilsey, she talks in turtle dove English. No, Bertie. Mr. Gilsey, do you know how she talks to you? Yes, Bertie. That's right, she talks to you in turtle dove English. <laughs> Marjorie, your table looks very pretty, doesn't it, Marie? Lovely. You're a very charming hostess, Marjorie. Well, thank you. Oh, you folks don't have to say those nice things. Marge is going to feed you anyway. <laughs> Gee, I wonder what's keeping Mr. Hammond. He'll be along. When I left the plant, he was talking to Washington on the phone. Oh, it would still be a nice party if he didn't come at all. Oh, Marie, you just want to be with Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> <laughs> Well, oh, Marie, we mustn't make Mr. Hammond feel like a fifth wheel. I'm so glad Unky and Marie are here. We, we wouldn't know how to entertain him, would we, Bronco? No, it's not easy to do. Mr. Hammond's strictly business. Well, there he is, Kitty. Oh, yes, Bronco, you go to the door. Well, why don't we both go to the door? Well, I think you should go. We could all go. Now, Bronco, get the door! Bertie, please. I'll go. Does the house look all right, Unky? Hey, Marjorie, relax. Well, Mr. Hammond. Hello, Bronco. Oh, welcome to our little home. Here, let me take your hat and coat. And your gloves. Thank you. I hope I'm not late. Oh, no. No. The others are just early. <laughs> Say, he's not as old as I thought he'd be. You mean a man that young owns a big plant? Well, I looked younger than that when I started running the water department. Yeah, right in here, Mr. Hammond. Well, I... I want you to meet my wife, Marjorie. Uh, I've heard a lot about you, Marjorie. I've been looking forward to meeting you, Mr. Hammond. And this is Miss Marie Olson. How do you do, Mr. Hammond? How do you do? What a charming accent. Thank you. Yes, and this is Marjorie's uncle, Mr. Gildersleeve. Mr. Gildersleeve? It's a pleasure, Mr. Hammond. You've no doubt heard of me. I'm city water commissioner. <laughs> oh, uh, yes, I've heard of you, Silversleeve. Uh, <laughs> Gildersleeve, Throckmorton P. Oh, isn't that what I said? <laughs> well, I've been working too hard, Bronco. You'll have to assume more of my duties. Oh, anything you say, Mr. Hammond. Is that a promotion, Bronco? Shh, 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 shh. <laughs> well, uh, let's everybody sit down and visit before dinner, huh? A good idea. Well, uh, Marjorie, I imagine you kids hate to give up this cozy little place for Paris. Oh, no. We're so indebted to you for the opportunity to go, Mr. Hammond. Yeah, Marjorie's so right. <laughs> well, Bronco's earned it. The trip to Paris is all Marjorie has been able to talk about. Miss Olson, I, I can't quite place that delightful accent of yours. May I sit here by you? If you wish. I was going to sit there. <laughs> Obviously, you've spent quite a lot of time abroad. Oh, yes. She speaks five languages. Marie's a very interesting conversationalist. Mm -hmm. Do you two converse in foreign languages? Well, I only speak English. <laughs> but I used to speak a little Latin when I was in high school. You know, I guess all of us have to take a little Latin, eh, Mr. Hammond? It certainly helped me when I was setting up my branch offices in Europe, especially in Paris. Do you speak French, Mr. Hammond? Oh, a little. Je suis sûr que mon français n'est pas aussi bon que le vôtre. Oh, au contraire. Vous parlez très bien. Well, merci, mademoiselle. Show off. <laughs> Say, that's, that's very good, Mr. Hammond. Hey, Marjorie, I hope you'll forgive me for brushing up a little. Well, I thought it was charming. Well, that's only because Miss Olsen is so charming. Oh, thank you, Mr. Hammond. I thought he ran from women. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm indebted to you for having Miss Olson here tonight, but of course, that's the thoughtful hostess. Oh, Mr. Hammond. Yeah, we're glad you're having a good time. Isn't this working out wonderfully, Anki? Oh, yes. Uh, dinner, sir. Oh, thank you, Bertie. Uh, shall we go into the dining room? I'm sure everybody's starved. Oh, uh, Mr. Hammond, I think Marge is seating you, our guest of honor, next to Miss Olson. Zeke. Wonderful. My arm, Miss Olson. This is like having dessert before I get to the table. <laughs> How very corny. Uh, may I escort you to the table, Marge, honey? Uh-huh. Come along. I'll take your arm, too, Anki. No, no. Go ahead. 
I'll bring up the rear. I'm not only a fifth wheel, I'm a flat tire. <laughs> Gildersleeve will be back in just a minute. Parley Bayer played Mr. Hammond. In the old days of radio, I could almost tell the kind of part it was going to be by the director who hired me. Some saw me as a rural hay raker, and somebody else saw me as a booming second-rate politician. It's good that people don't all think alike. Are <laughs> you playing the like the Indian said? Everybody would want his squaw. <laughs> In the fall, Gildersleeve shifted formats, becoming a weeknight 15-minute serial, before returning to a half hour in the fall of 1955. The last great Gildersleeve radio episode would air on March 21, 1957. You did the radio Gildersleeve right to the very end of radio, and near the end, I think, I think we were the last 15 minute shows then, weren't you? For two years before the end of Arrow, we did it as a five-week, 15-minute show, mm -hmm. and it was very, very popular at that time. And then we went back after Crash dropped it to a half-hour format. We were the last audience mm. show in Hollywood. By uh, that time, you were only doing one show then. Yes. You weren't doing two shows, one for the East Coast and one for the West Coast, were you? No, we, by that time, it was on tape. But that took a long time to happen because Kraft had a very adverse feeling about tape. They didn't like tape. <laughs> the way we got to taping, what, under Kraft's supervision anyway, I had to have an appendectomy. So I recorded the first scene and the last scene for what was to be the next show. And I did the show one Wednesday, went in Thursday morning to the hospital and had my operation. And in actuality, I could have done the show the next week, but they uh, did this to protect themselves. And then later when they found out that it didn't change the show any, why we were able to go to tape. So the other actors did the show live, but they, they inserted, the your, inserted your record. Your, yeah, the uh, record uh, opening and the record uh, close. So you were kind of written out of the I body home, of the I show. I stayed home and listened to shows. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it. Didn't you think he was obnoxious? No, sir, to tell the truth, I can't rightly say he was. What? Mr. Hammond told me my cooking was a gastronomic delight, and that's not obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> well. Yes, sir. So you know what I think? Mr. Hammond's a fine man. For more info on the show's transition from Perry to Waterman, yes, tune into Breaking Walls, episode 120. It's too late, Unky. Beat you to the punch again. Uh, Mr. Hammond's one fine man. He's a show-off, a flatterer, and an all-round sneaky type character.